All right, so we're going to get started. We have a, a lot to cover today, um, and we want to make sure we're able to get to it. Uh, so as folks are streaming in, so welcome to our webinar today. I'm Shane. Uh, you can see my colleague Olivia and our special guest Denise will all introduce ourselves properly in a minute or two. Uh, but this is, we're going to talk about mastering the virtual presentation and uh, specifically how to make and how to execute a good e-lightning poster, which is specific to the AGU fall meeting. Um, but we'll talk about the differences there in a second. But before we even get going, I want to kind of poll everyone. So you should see this poll pop up. And uh, just quick spot check. I want to gauge people's uh, comfort in this, regardless of whether you've given a excuse me, a virtual presentation or before or not, doesn't really matter. Just how's everyone feel about this from a one to five in your comfort? All right, so as more people come on, if you could just please uh, take this poll, just let us know your comfort in giving a virtual presentation of any sort. I'll leave this up for another few seconds. Most folks have voted. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, so that's that's a really nice bell curve. So somewhere in the middle, uh, we have a, a almost a majority here around three. All right, that's good to know. So like I said, welcome. My name is Shane, and this is part of our uh, HEU Sharing Science webinar series. So we're going to talk about some specific things about the HEU fall meeting that's coming up in oh goodness a month. Um, but this is not specific to that. There's gonna be some general tips as well. But for those of you who have no idea who HEU is, who the American Geophysical Union is, we're a giant Earth and Space Science Society, 22 journals. We usually have a giant in-person fall meeting every year uh, that has over uh, 25,000 attendees, a lot of smaller topical conferences. This year, our meeting is online like everything else, but it's still gonna be pretty big. Within HEU is what we do in sharing science. So the sharing science program, we are scientists who teach other scientists how to mostly talk to non-scientists. Uh, but basically we provide skills, tools, resources, opportunities to help scientists communicate in any way to any audience of their choosing, even if that's just other scientists. And we do this through a whole bunch of different ways. Our bread and butter are these workshops and webinars. Uh, our workshops have gone online. If you're interested in kind of a more in-depth uh, conversation around that, we're always happy to talk to folks. We do things virtually. In a non-COVID world, we do things in person. But we also have a ton of online resources. We have a very active Twitter account. We have a really uh, robust website, all sorts of things. So if after this you're interested in what we do, look us up. This is the second to last in a webinar series we've had all year. Uh, you can see we've had to do some editing because originally we were going to have a virtual uh, presentation work or webinar and an e-lightning webinar and uh, deadline shifted on us. So we just put them all together. But if you're interested in any of these webinars we've done previously, we have a whole archive you can go to and we'll pass that information along uh, in a follow-up email. We have one more coming up in early December that we encourage you to check out. Okay, so who are we? So like I said, my name is Shane Hanlon. Uh, I'm one of the two core employees uh, in HU Sharing Science Program. I am a research scientist by training. I have a PhD in conservation ecology and I used to study amphibians and reptiles as a herpetologist. Um, I came to this world by doing a, essentially a policy postdoc in Washington, DC, uh, outside of which I'm located now. And I loved that work, but I wanted to do more of the communication type stuff. And I ended up at AGU where I get to dabble in a whole bunch of different things, still get to be involved in 
uh, with doing with working with scientists and research and communication policy, all sorts of things. So that's me. I'll let Olivia introduce herself. Sure. Thanks, Shane. So yes, I'm Olivia Ambrogio. Um, uh, also working in sharing science. Also a biologist by training. It just turned out that way. Uh, got my PhD studying the sex lives of marine snails, which are extremely interesting and which I'm happy to tell people about at length, uh, at the drop of a hat, basically. In fact, there I am taking pictures of um, horseshoe crabs and I try to do sort of stealth educating on the beach with people who are unsuspecting and walking along and say, oh, what are those? And then I tell them more than perhaps they anticipated. Uh, and yeah, ended up at Sharing Science trying to help other scientists do similar things. Shane, you're muted. Oh, there we go. See, you would think after seven webinars, I'd be better at this. Uh, we have a special guest today who's not an AGU employee. Uh, Denise, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, so I am uh, Denise Hills. I work for the Geological Survey of Alabama, which is a state government agency um, where I do research uh, on energy, uh, oil and gas, uh, geologic carbon sequestration, all sorts of fun things. In fact, um, I gave a really fun Upgoer 5 talk through the Sharing Science program a couple of years ago about geological carbon sequestration. And I encourage you guys to go check those out because those are so much fun. Um, I also, uh, uh, a few years ago, I um, was in the initial co AGU cohort of Voices for Science, which is um, a policy advocacy program that uh, HEU has started um, to help provide uh, researchers with um, science, scientists with uh, uh, support. Sorry, my daughter just, just dropped my cat on my desk, uh, so I got a little distracted. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, where um, HEU provides the support to help uh, develop relationships with policymakers. Um, I think it's an excellent program. And if you have kind of like Olivia talking about, you know, the sex lives of sea snails, um, I am happy to talk about Voices for Science at the drop of the hat. Um, <laughs> uh, so please reach out to me if you have any questions about that. And I am honored to be presenting today um, about e-lightning presentations. Thanks, Denise. So just off the top, we might as well just talk about this. We're going to be very candid about what it's like to give a virtual presentation because we are ourselves all at home. I haven't seen Olivia in person in eight months or something like that. And so the way we are presenting to all of you is how we would present to anyone. So this, like, you can't make this up. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so to start off though, we're gonna focus on virtual presentations, uh, but we're gonna talk about kind of presentations more broadly. And for this, I'm gonna let Olivia take it away. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, the, the good thing is that a lot of the things that we're talking about are relevant, whether the presentation is in person or it's virtual, um, except that you're probably less likely to have a cat dropped on you if you're doing an in-person presentation. Although I feel that would add a lot to presentations, so maybe it's something we should consider for the future. You know, uh, program committee people, next fall meeting, there's an opportunity. So, you know, why should you care about mastering the art of presentation? Why is it so valuable? Well, for one thing, everything that is done in science, all of this blood and sweat and tears and swearing needs to come to something, right? And presentations are an excellent way of being sort of that, that first move of sharing what you've done and all of the hard work that you've done and the cool things that you've discovered with a much wider audience. Um, and not just that, obviously, they're terrific, whether they're virtual or in person, as part of your resume or CV. Um, they're a great way, too, of letting other people know, here's my stake in this research area. Here's what I'm doing so you know what I'm working on and also to prevent other people from unintentionally replicating work that you've already done, wasting their time potentially. And if you're newer to the field, this is a great way to introduce yourself to other researchers and other scientists. Also, it's an excellent way of getting feedback. This is your opportunity to share where you are now and hear from other people get the kinds of questions that they're asking, the suggestions that they might have that could really help 
um, give you a new angle and perspective on what you're doing or what you intend to do next. Similarly, you're going to have the opportunity to meet, well, or virtually meet, get to know people who are doing uh, work in similar areas who can potentially provide you with insights on what you're looking at. And of course, you have this great opportunity to uh, find new collaborators. And I really do want to emphasize that. I think even more with virtual uh, presentations potentially than with ones in person, simply because a lot of people who can't necessarily come in person to a conference are going to be you know, uh, engaging online. There's this potential with a, with an, a group of scientists as wide and diverse as the AGU membership to really find unexpected um, collaborators and foster novel partnerships. And that's why I have these images on the screen here that I drew this uh, lichen and this bobtail squid that um, has a symbiotic relationship with a bacteria that helps it light up. And then obviously the clownfish and the anemone, you know, like if, if species in different kingdoms can make partnerships, then surely, you know, different uh, AGU disciplines can come together to have fruitful new research. So with that as a major benefit of presentations and virtual presentations, I think in particular, what are some things you want to remain aware of to make the most of what you're doing? Well, first and foremost, um, so, you know, science is a very, we've become a very specialized kind of operation, right? Everybody has their extremely narrow area of expertise. And that can sometimes be great because it allows so many more people to reach out in so many directions, but it can also be awful because almost no one knows what you're talking about. Let me give you an example. Uh, so here's me. I'm not putting this up just to show off, maybe a little, but you know, I am a well-educated, smart person with a background in science. But when I hear a lot of the science that a lot of the AGU members are doing, if they're just telling me like straight out of their abstract, these are the expressions that I am making. Maybe, maybe in my heart, maybe not actually making, but these are basically the expressions I am making. Now you might be thinking to yourself, oh, well, you know, biologists, what do they know? But I want to remind you, like this is, this is true. Our disciplines are a lot smaller than we want to think they are. So I want to give you an example. When I was in grad school in a general biology department, everybody gave research talks, right? And so we'd have all of these people who were doing work in sort of the, the ecology and botany fields who would be giving talks. And we'd all sort of, the rest of us, you know, animal people and so on would be sitting next to each other going, what the hell is betula? What does that mean? You know, and eventually some kind people went up to those presenters afterwards and said things like, maybe you could also say maple and birch and oak would be nice. Um, so, you know, obviously you don't have the same kind of concern about species names, most of you, as you're developing your presentations. But I would really urge you to remember that there are a lot of specific phrases or words that are not going to be universally understood. Um, and I just want to emphasize this a little more. So this is Greta the jargon monster. Her mouth is full of words from abstracts. And I am not trying to suggest that in a presentation at a scientific conference, you should get rid of jargon. Jargon is around for a reason. It is the shorthand that we use to describe technical terminology so that it doesn't take us 12 years to give our presentations. And it's also um, kind of a code, right, by which we let other people in our sphere know that we know what we're talking about. So I'm not trying to discount the value of jargon. I'm just trying to emphasize that even at um, scientific conferences, the more you can reduce, reduce jargon and the more that you can define the jargon that you use in other terms, the more people you're going to reach, even among scientists, because sometimes the same word means different things in different fields, or sometimes it's just not something that people are going to be familiar with. And again, if you want to foster those broader collaborations, you really need to think about this. One way to sort of, uh, I think could be a useful way to guide as you're trying to think of what that might look like is to take a look at plain language summaries. These are these um, 
much less jargon heavy versions of abstracts that people are putting in many AGU journals and many other scientific journals as well. And you can use our hashtag size summary to see the ones that we at um, Sharing Science share. We share some great ones from all of the different journals on our Twitter account. I say we, but Shane does all of the actual work. Um, but yeah, you know, take a look and you can, you can get some inspiration. We've also developed a toolkit to help you think about how to develop plain language summaries. And I do think that, again, this can be a useful guideline as you're working on your presentation too. Just to reiterate, I'm not saying get rid of your jargon. This is a scientific talk, I understand. I'm just saying think about the points at which you can also rephrase that jargon. Or if you have friends who are in different disciplines but who might still be going to age you, can you practice with them in advance of recording your presentation to see which words are sort of sticking points for them? Or, or made it made them feel that it was harder to follow what was going on. And then finally, and really importantly, especially if you're hoping to reach and capture the attention of more people, is you want to really emphasize and spell out the big picture around your work. And you really need to be explicit about what is the context? Where is this study that you're doing coming from? What do we know more broadly? Why does that matter? So, you know, where did your work come into this? And then what are the implications of it? And again, really spelling that out is going to be very valuable because we become so um, immersed in our own field that we're not aware that a lot of the things that we take for granted are not necessarily things that even other researchers are going to know offhand. So spelling that out and making clear why what you're doing matters in a broader sense is going to be really valuable, both to make your presentation more compelling and to help you um, find those people who are also working on similar issues. And with that, Shane's going to tell you some more sort of presentation tips. Yeah, thanks, Olivia. Uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of the mix between in-person and virtual, because again, a lot of this stuff is universal. I'm gonna get into specific like, tech things and about dynamics and that type of thing for virtual. But before I do that, uh, I'm kind of interested in how many of you have uh, ever given a virtual presentation in any capacity? And not just this year, I know it was much less common before, but I just want to gauge where folks are at. All right. Most folks have voted. I'll give you another few seconds. All right. So it seems like a majority of you have done this in some capacity. And that's great. Hopefully there are things in here that you will learn to help it make help you make that presentation even better. And for those of you who haven't, we're going to cover that as well. We go through a whole bunch of different things. So with that, like I said, I want to cover kind of basic presentation tips. And this is for an in-person world, but this is most certainly for a virtual world as well. I love this uh, this cartoon by Alyssa Ako, and it's showing, I've certainly been on both sides of this equation, what you don't want as a presenter. Basically, everyone is thinking about something that has nothing to do with what you're talking about. I don't want that right now. Like We can't see any of you, but I hope that you're at least taking in some of what I'm saying right now. The goal is to not have this, to not have literally one person thinking, oh, I wonder this thing about what they're presenting on. And so there are some basic things that in person or virtual, it doesn't really make a difference, that these are kind of these universal tips. So the first one is text on slides. Like I said, I come from a research background. This is the first presentation I ever gave as a grad student, and it's not good. 
I like to think my delivery was good, but there's just, it's just slides and slides of text. There's, there's pictures here and there. Later on, I get into, I did some aquatic work, but it's just dry figures and text and all of this. And it's just, it's not engaging. Um, there are ways that I could have done this that would have been so much better that would have gotten my point across. And this was, like I said, this was my first presentation in grad school. I hadn't really done this before. I'm actually pretty happy that I was able to find this. This was my last presentation that I ever gave as a grad student on similar stuff, not exactly the same, but in the same realm. And I never consciously thought about this, but I'm actually really happy with the way that my presentation skills progressed because yes, there are still text on these. There's text by necessities, especially if I'm going to talk about the question I asked or the methods or whatever the uh, results might be. But for the most part, I tried to keep it to a minimum and just let my actual voice speak to what was happening and have the pictures in this case be kind of like a guide to carry this process along. Um, so regardless of whether you're in person or in virtual, and I'll touch on virtual specifically in a second, having less text on slides is usually better. The next thing is reading straight from slides. This is just not great. Um, honestly, I tried to find pictures of people doing this through our very large bank of AGU photos. And it turns out that, like, so this presenter, in my mind, this one was reading from the slides, this one wasn't, but we're not one I wanna take pictures of people reading straight from the slides. So I couldn't really find a great visual representation of this, but chances are we've all seen this. The person who is just, and and maybe we've been there, I probably was in the beginning of when I started doing this, who's just locked under slides, not making any eye contact, definitely reading from it. And that's not interesting. That presenter is not presenting in a way that folks are gonna to wanna to listen to them uh, because if they're just reading from their slides, then what's the purpose of actually presenting? The attendees in that audience could just read a manuscript or, or something else. They don't actually need to be there. So reading straight from the slides in any universe is ill-advised. In a virtual world, this could take on a few different things. So my setup, you can see like I, I'm in this room, the same room. I have a, an external monitor straight in front of me, but my laptop is over here. And that's where when I'm in presenter mode, there are notes over here to the side. If I was to actually read from my notes, I literally wouldn't be looking at the screen. And this is, this is not good. I'm all, not always staring straight at the camera, but I'm at least looking in the direction of the camera. So reading from the notes, reading straight from your notes can be a detriment just from a technological standpoint. Now you wanna make sure, I'm also, like I said, I'm also not doing this, I'm not staring at the camera the entire time because that's not where my screen is, my screen's below it. But this is at least better. It's, it's, I'm a, it at least seems like I'm talking to all of you all versus just talking and you all are here. Don't get bogged down in the details. And we as scientists love to do this because we're so passionate about what we do. We just wanna talk about it so much, but this is important in any sort of communication, but especially with presentations. I have this, uh, these figures up here. These are figures from a study that we use a lot in workshops that we do. When we're talking about representation in the sciences and why representation is important full stop, uh, but not, not uniquely, but especially in the sciences. Like not all scientists look like me. Like I am a face of science. I am not the face of science. And so when talking about these figures, what's happening here is in the bottom left, there's a study that came out showing that uh, attitudes on climate change changed depending on folks' race and who was in the White House. Before Obama was in the White House, it didn't matter whether you were African-American or white. There was uh, a consensus around the acceptance of climate change. But once President Obama got in there, acceptance among white Americans went down with the only thing changing, at least in his controlled measures, was the fact that we now had our first black president. And that has continued on the other figure about racial resentment, as racial resentment increases, the acceptance of climate change happening decreases and the acceptance that it is our fault also decreases. 
that is exactly what I would say in a workshop. That is how I would describe these two figures because it covers everything. It gets the highlights, it gets the, the story across. I could go so much deeper. I read this manuscript. I think this is a really great uh, thing to talk about, but that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you the high level stuff so that I can keep moving, but I have the citation there. So if folks wanna dive into it, they can. I understand that when you're presenting your research, it might not be published. Chances are it probably isn't. So you probably don't have a thing to point to. So you, maybe you can't do the citation thing, but at the same time, folks can come talk to you afterwards. Granted, we're in a virtual space now, so you don't have the moment where people come up to you after your, your talk and talk to you in person, but put your uh, email address, put your website, put your Instagram account, put your Twitter, whatever it might be, put that information on there because if folks wanna talk about the details, they'll find you. Practice, don't memorize. Uh, this is so important. When you memorize something word for word, people can tell. They can tell that you are reading from a script in your mind. And that's, that's not engaging. People don't love that. But if you practice and know the main points of what you're trying to say, know the content, but maybe not everything word for word, it comes across like you are you're the expert in that you are knowledgeable in it but yet you're still hopefully at least engaging to listen to i know i do this i've never been a memorizer i love the i love being able to think on my feet about the exact words that come to mind even though i know exactly what i'm going to say so for this i actually did talk to text i went through this three times this exact slide thinking about what i would say for this slide and did talk to text for each slide and each or each time I did it, and each time this took me a minute to do, I ran through these back to back to back. Every single time what I said was different. The exact words that came out of my mouth were different, but the message was the same. And I think that's the most important thing. As long as that message stays the same, the exact words don't matter and allows you to be flexible uh, depending on what else has gone on in the presentation or what else is how you're feeling or whatever it might be. So practice, but try not to memorize word for word. Be dynamic. Oh my gosh. So in a real world, this is easy for some, especially easy for me. I give lots of presentations. I am a storyteller. I'm very, you can probably tell the way I move my hands and everything. I'm very emotive. <laughs> side note, I have Olivia and Denise on my side screen. Every once in a while I look over and I just see them laughing. So here we are. But in a, in a virtual world, this is difficult. So it's important, you don't have to put an act on. I would never advocate for that, be yourself. But oftentimes being ourselves is going to come across in a virtual world. I had to give this, you're not gonna hear sound or anything, but I had to give this presentation for uh, AGU and um, I recorded it ahead of time. And I wanted to be engaging because it was recorded. I actually wasn't going to be there. So I tried to not be, not turn it up to say 11, but try to be a little bit more conversive and emotive and actually have the people listening to it um, not be kind of upset that they were listening to it. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, there are some different things about the virtual world. I've been kind of covering both at this point, but let's face it, you all are here because virtual is different and I recognize that. So we'll quickly review these points and then talk about some very unique things to the virtual world. The text on slide thing is super important. Uh, I've given a handful of presentations, um, sorry, uh, outside of the, um, outside of the workshops and stuff we do. And it's helpful to not have a ton of text on the slides, even in, even in this world of, let's see, this is going to work for me. That's a nice face. Okay. So I'm talking to everyone about something, but it, you have to make it so that folks are getting value out of watching a presentation. They're going to get value out of what you're doing because if you just put a bunch of text up there especially in a virtual world why are they watching a presentation they could just be reading a manuscript or going to a website or going on social media or something you have to do something that makes them 
not necessarily want to be there, but make them not regret their decision to be there. The straight from the slides thing is super important, right? So I already touched on this. This is what my two displays look like. You could probably see it in the reflection here of my, my DC poster. Uh, so this is very awkward if I was just doing this the whole time. There is a cheat with this one though. Uh, I've seen folks do this where they'll put up a note card kind of in the middle of their display by their camera. Uh, if you absolutely need this, this is a, a uh, this is an option. Still though, you don't really wanna read straight from your slides or read straight from your notes. Uh, you can also have paper as well. So these are more uh, kind of like the note card in the back pocket idea, the, the just, just, just in case. But for the most part, I'd say just avoid it. Uh, we'll get back to the practice, don't memorize in a second. Don't get bogged down. Folks' attention spans in the virtual world are reduced. We are all experiencing quote unquote Zoom fatigue. We're on screens all day. If you get bogged down in the details, you're gonna lose your audience. So just keep things high and interesting. Get to your main points, make sure you get across what you want people to walk away with, but avoid getting bogged down. And putting these together, like I said, practice, don't memorize, and try to be dynamic. Uh, you see our faces on the side of your PowerPoint, Olivia and I do this all the time, but even when we're talking, we try to be as dynamic as possible without seeming kind of ridiculous and over the top. It's, it, everyone's mileage may vary, uh, but it's important to think about this, especially in a virtual world. Things that are very unique to uh, the virtual world are your tech, right? Think about where your camera is. So like I said, my camera's right in front of me. So this is like what it looks like when I'm talking to people, what you're seeing right now, when I'm talking to folks. But I have an external camera. I made the decision to get one when all of this started to put right in front of me. Um, I know not everyone has that. I'm fortunate enough to do that. But if I was just using my laptop camera, it's over here. Like that's, this is not a good angle. This works maybe for um, informal conversations or even if you're, I've seen professors do this for lectures, but if you're giving a presentation, try not to do that. Try to have the camera right in front of you because it means a lot more if you're talking like this versus if you're seeing the side of my face. Backgrounds are really important. You don't wanna to have too much going on in your background. I love this background. I'm very fortunate to have an office where I have a wall full of just really cool stuff. So I don't need most of the time the virtual background, but uh, especially for Zoom, it's very popular in Zoom. Some of the other platforms have it as well. You can have virtual backgrounds. With that, know your audience, know who you're talking to, engage that level of professionalism. My standard go-to backgrounds are in the before times, I did a lot of traveling. So mine are usually kind of like landscapes or fun places I visited. There's not too much going on. Uh, they're very kind of plain um, and they might spark conversation like, oh, hey, where was that at? Um, this is the Pacific Northwest. I don't have any really super silly backgrounds because I just, I don't do that. Um, some folks do it for fun here and there and that's fine. But if you're giving a scientific presentation at a professional meeting, and you have to put a, a background up that's not just like a flat background or a background like I have behind me, keep it neutral or, or not distracting. You don't want people paying more attention to what's going on behind you than they are paying attention to the slides that you're showing or what you're saying. Having said that, things happen. So do the best you can with uh with what you got uh but just keep it by that you want people listening to you and seeing what you want them to see versus what's happening behind you think about the equipment you want uh so if you're using something like zoom and that's a really popular one you can go into uh, a zoom meeting and actually pick your equipment it's really helpful to almost always have headphones my only, so you see on some pictures I had headphones, sometimes I don't. My only caveat with this is maybe you don't need them if you don't need to hear anything. So if you're perhaps giving a pre-recorded lecture that no one's gonna hear, you don't need to hear anything in real time, maybe you don't need headphones. But if you do, in something like Zoom, you can go through and pick the different options you have. You could pick what camera you have, 
you could pick what inputs and outputs you have. So I have these speakers, these are my headphones. This, I have an external microphone, which I'm using right now. Um, you can pick these things as well. So just kind of keep that in mind and you can go through and test all of your settings uh, when you're in the meeting. And then you could do the same before the meeting, just go into your settings, pick these different, uh, pick your different AV considerations, your different tech. One thing to keep in mind is that know your tech. So the moment where I, um, I was talking and nothing was coming out, my microphone, my external microphone has a mute button that I'll push once in a while, but sometimes I forget to turn it off. So I think I'm, I think I'm getting one over on everyone because I'm not using the Zoom mute function or the software mute function, I'm doing it on my hardware, but then that doesn't work. So just, it's a lot of things to remember, but knowledge of your equipment will go a long way in helping things to run smoothly. This may seem counterintuitive because who's actually comfortable doing this? Um, but be as casual or as comfortable as you can be, right? Um, I, will, I will say that I give a lot of presentations and I try to dress for the occasion. So this shirt is, to be, is an astronaut holding a beer, but it's an AGU shirt. So it was for an AGU meeting, that was fine. I teach a class for University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. So I'd always wear a lot of like Pennsylvania inspired stuff. And then once in a while, when I actually give presentations, I put on a collar shirt and once in a while I'll grow a mustache for it. That has nothing to do with this. But I dress for how I want to be perceived. But at the same time, I recognize that this is a weird system we're in. And so I try to be as casual as possible. And I just want to reiterate that being casual does not mean being unprofessional. Folks at scientific meetings, scientists usually dress however the heck they want, and that's fine. It shouldn't be any different in a virtual setting. Things shouldn't change that much in the way you present yourself. Um, but one thing is, is that we can be a little bit more comfortable because things are going to happen. And that's the last point I really wanna talk about the unexpected. Denise's daughter dropped a cat on her desk uh, while she was talking. That happens. My dog once in a while, and my old setup used to like to photo bomb me. That happens. Some of us have kids, some of us have pets, some of us have um, partners or housemates who might be on Zoom calls at the same time. Internet might go out, something might happen. It happens. If you're pre-recording something, you have a lot more flexibility in making sure you get it right through multiple takes, and that's great. If it's live, it's live, and it happens. We've all come to accept this, and we are doing the best we can, and I actually really enjoy that things have become a little bit more casual because we've shown that we can be casual yet professional. So kind of my, my take home for all of this is just, just roll with it and it'll be absolutely fine. Nobody's going to dock you for your cat walking across your keyboard while you're giving a presentation. Now, these have all been really general things and I'm gonna talk briefly about AGU and then we'll take questions for the virtual presentation part and then let Denise talk specifically about e-lightning because I know we probably have two kind of different audiences here. For AGU, if you're attending AGU, my best suggestion to all of you is go to the website and this might seem like a cop-out but there is so much information that the website's great you can go you can figure out the presenter resources and honestly if you're not going to hu a lot of these resources are really great from a uh kind of universal perspective but specifically there's things on giving an oral presentation, on an e-lightning presentation, on a poster presentation. There are times when the sessions are, there are kind of the um, more generic additional resources as well. There are uh, the presentation hours for the live part of the oral session, and some of them are recorded and some of them are oral. There are before the meeting and during the meeting. There's all sorts of resources here. So if you click on some of these tabs, for example, if you click on the oral presenter tab, all the information you ever need to know about when to do it, 
uh, when, uh, like the programs to use, how to do it. A lot of these deadlines are November 20th, so you have some time. Uh, there's some uh, resources that have already happened, some presentations, and a really great thing is some of our staff here are doing office hours, and there's actually a couple more of these coming up. So if you wanna have some hands-on training, we provide that. Same thing for eLightning. Denise is gonna talk about a little bit about this, more about presenting from a presenter perspective, not necessarily the uploading and that type of thing. We have all of those resources as well. And then also for uh, Virtual Proster. So lots of resources, fallmeeting.hu.org, it will really be the one-stop shop. The last thing is if you are giving a recorded presentation of any capacity, you should have gotten an email that looks something like this. I'm giving something for what for our mass media fellowship. And so you can go, essentially you follow the instructions. Um, there's some recording slots. Mine's a little bit different with deadlines, but basically you go, you sign in, and then it will kind of guide you through the process. So for AGU specific tech upload deadlines all of that go to the fall meeting website go to the presenter resources and almost everything you should need to know will be there and if not you can schedule one of those consultations those one-on-one -on -one consultations with staff okay so that was a lot uh we're going to take a pause right now to answer not all um we want to we want to make sure we keep some folks with us but answer some questions about presentations more broadly. Yeah, so, and we got a lot of good questions. Um, so we'll try to go through, as Shane said, some of them, we might not get to all of them right now, we'll try to get to some later, or we can uh, follow up afterwards. So I see one, uh, I'm not a cartoonist and I don't draw, but I love car the cartoons you show, they spice up talk, what software can I use? Um, so this is a great question. One, I would encourage you to to try, even if you don't consider yourself a cartoonist, just stick figures. I know they seem silly, but they are also, because they're so different from the usual sort of stock images and, you know, PowerPoint stock stuff that we show, they, they can be really compelling. That said, I'm not trying to force anybody if they don't feel comfortable. Um, I really recommend looking at uh, sources like Wikimedia Commons to find, um, you know, uh, content that you can use and change depending on what sort of um, attributions they have and um, what kind of, you know, uh, Creative Commons license they're under that will let you not just take images that already exist, but manipulate them a little bit to make them more your own um, if you want to. There are also some things, I don't know if there's one that's more general, but there's a site called BioRender where I think there's some free stuff and some that you have to pay for, but you can get images that are like around, you know, um, a whole suite of, you know, lab items or um, people or all kind of, and they're sort of cartoony drawn kind of things. You can also, if you're looking for just a, a, a comic or cartoon of some sort to make a point, if you find something where you can share it with attribution and that's okay under whatever license it is, that's also really good. And I. I would just emphasize with all of these, know what kind of um, license there is and what sort of attribution you need to give to make sure that you're uh, crediting the person who created whatever it is appropriately. Um, Shane, there are a couple of questions around audio. Mm -hmm. um, one is, is more text on presentations more helpful in virtual presentations when audio quality may cut in and out? I'm going to jump in even before you go, Shane, to say, I would say it's better to make sure your audio works um, than to try to solve this by putting text on the slides, because that's going to be a problem with the presentation regardless. But Shane, you may also have more advice on how to do that. Yeah, I would just say, if you know that you have, if you're giving a live presentation and you know you have a spotty internet connection, and that just sometimes that's unavoidable, then maybe yes, maybe there are situations in which you wanna make sure that you wanna get the message across, even if it's you can't do it in a in a, a vocal way, let's say. Um, so there there's always exceptions, of course. Still, uh, if possible, I'd say still try to reduce them, but of course there's always gonna be exceptions. All right, we have um, a question about 
Can you speak logistically a little how to record using what platform are slides plus video better than just slides? Which platform puts that little picture of you in the corner? Um, we don't have to go into this in depth, but Shane, you may want to address it a little. So, uh, okay. So I'm just, let's see if this works. I'm just going to kind of show this. So y'all are going to get to see more of my screen than I anticipated, but that's fine. So I use Zoom. What you were seeing is Zoom. Basically with Zoom is, so when you go into Zoom, regardless of what kind of an account you have, this is what you'll see in some capacity. You can just create a meeting. It doesn't have, you don't have to schedule anything. You just create it. And this is going to be really meta. Um, I wonder if it's not going to show. Yeah, so I'm using too many webcams because it's already using for something. But essentially what I did is I shared my screen so that it showed this. And then in Zoom, you can, um, where is it? Uh, oh, record. And so when you record, if I was to record this, it would show up in the corner and it would see what you see and then it just saves as a video. Um, that's a quick and dirty way. Honestly, you can just Google it uh, for a more in-depth analysis. But I use Zoom and you can just use it like a video recording platform. You do not actually have to schedule a meeting or anything. And I believe that in some of those presentation resources that are through the fall meeting um, presenters website, they actually go into some detail in the PDF on uh, ways in which to do these sorts of different presentations and you know whether you're in it or not. Uh, we have a question, presentation titles that were submitted were made with journal articles in mind, so it doesn't sound super interesting to everyone else. Now those titles are what people can see. Can we edit that? Can we make it more interesting? If not, how can we entice people? It's a great question. I am going to go with probably you cannot edit anything at this point. Um, that said, you know, all of the hashtags around this meeting, you know, AGU20 and specific ones, I think, for sections and so on, are in a flurry right now and will be even more so as we lead into the, the conference itself. So I would say that social media is a great way to um, get this to be more enticing. And Irene, since I know you and I know you make awesome gifts, this would be a great time to do a little animation to help promote your particular uh, session and make it more enticing. But even without that, should you have a better idea of how to frame what you're talking about? You know, if you are on social media, this is a great time to do it. Or, you know, the old fashioned way of sending emails to people you know and people you sort of know. Say, hey, I think you would find this fascinating. Um, Let's see here, a uh, quick question about, does it really make a difference if you're using a microphone and headset versus the microphone in the computer when recording a presentation? Uh, yes, but yes. Shay? <laughs> yes, it doesn't, unless unless you have a micro, unless your headset has a broken microphone and you have a microphone issue, it it makes a difference. Um, I'm Like I said, I'm using an external microphone because I have that. But my microphone in this headset is so much better than the microphone in my computer. So chances are you want to use, at the very least, your microphone in your headset. Because if nothing else, it's just closer. It's right here or right here. Or Denise has one that ha Denise and Libby have the ones that wrap around. But even something like, um, so I have AirPods. They even sound much better than me recording into my computer. So short answer is yes. Uh, question, what is the general consensus on having the camera on versus off for pre-recorded presentations? My webcam is low quality and I don't have the best lighting recording area. And I know some recording software doesn't allow webcam recording simultaneously with screen capture. Shane, do you want to take this one? Yeah, um, you don't need it. I mean, we've been, prior to everyone being in the virtual world, people, including ourselves, have been putting on webinars for years, which are really just virtual presentations. And honestly, when we do webinars, some of you have been to our webinars before, for the most part, we usually don't have our cameras on. Uh, we did for this one because it's a presentation on presentations. So no, you don't need to. I though, I personally like it because, because we are not we're not doing webinars for the most part. A lot of times these are presentations that would have otherwise been in person. So we're expecting to see people. So I kind of, I want people to see me and I want to see people. If you can't from a tech perspective, it's completely fine. The 
important thing is you get your work out there, you share your science. So if you can't, it's completely okay. But if you are able to, the quality is good, everything else work, everything else matches, I would encourage you to do it. Yeah. Um, quick one, any tips about the size of text and pictures? You know, this is tricky, especially since with the online format, we know people can be sort of closer to their screens with slides than they are necessarily to uh, presentations in person. That said, I would aim for nothing below like 18 point font, if possible, and ideally most things more. Um, especially like if you have a, a figure or tables that you're showing and the axes are really small because they came through whatever sort of statistical program you're using, get rid of them and relabel them bigger. That's that's always going to be better um, is my general rule. But if either of you have, have suggestions. Um. Wow, there are a ton of these. Sorry, I'm I'm going through two, and I I want to get to one that's really important. That, um, so we have a couple of folks who are federal scientists and who are not able to use Zoom. Uh, they the federal government has allowed Zoom. Um, so one thing is you can uh, PowerPoint. Weirdly enough, actually has a recording function. Uh, some of the other uh, Microsoft Suite things. So I think you can do this in Teams as well. So if you have the Microsoft Suite, uh, they allow you to do it as well. Um, if this isn't free, but if like if you have the Adobe Suite, there is one called Captivate. Uh, there's another program called Panapto. I know I'm just rattling off things here, but we will, like I said, we'll follow up and hopefully relatively soon. And we'll make sure that we pull together some of the other softwares out there uh, that aren't Zoom. I, so we recognize that Zoom is the most common, but some places cannot use that. So we don't want to um, make it sound like that's the only option. But just know there are other options. Like I said, Microsoft Suite has a handful, and then there are some ones mixed throughout. We'll pull together a list and make sure we share that with everyone. Shin, was there another that you were noticing that you wanted to hit on? Otherwise, I didn't want to go too long before we let Denise. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, just one more. So this one, because this is one I wrestle with, and you probably saw this in my presentations, but background for slides. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very fortunate that we have a branded program that our design team makes our slides. Most people don't have that. So light background or dark background? not a distracting background is my answer this is a personal preference thing i I've, I've gone back and forth on this i thought at one point having a black background with white letters was very like sleek and chic and, and it was very grab the attention of folks and that white with a with a black like white background with black text was just like stale and everything else i don't think that's true i really don't i think it is it is a personal preference just make sure that one it's not distracting and two, there are folks who can't see certain parts of the spectrum. Uh, red and greens, like red, red and green, greens, Christmas colors essentially, are sometimes not great for folks. So just keep that in mind as well. At the end of the day, you wanna have a, a captivating presentation, but you don't want it to be prohibitive. That's why you don't want a bunch of fancy animations or things flying around or stuff like that. So have something that's accessible, have something that people will be able to read and get something out of. That's what's most important. And I see we have a couple of questions around uh, posters already. So I think it's a great time to uh, let Denise talk. And then we'll have another section for questions where we'll try to get through as many of these others as we can and whatever new ones arise. And before we get to Denise, I'm going to put up another poll because for those of you sticking around for e-lightning, uh, I want to know, I guess we all want to know, um, <laughs> have uh, have any of you done this before? E-lightning isn't new, um, just the way we're doing it this year is a little different. So have any of you done this before? And this is, we're going to talk about kind of specific to AGU, but this exists in other ways at other associations. So the way we do it's one way, but this type of format is not unique to us. So it might happen if you're not an HU member, it might happen at your society at a meeting you've been to, a meeting you might go to. Uh, 
All right, so I'm gonna close this. So this isn't super surprising. Uh, majority of you is no, and and that's okay. Um, so if you're going to give one and you haven't before, if you've never heard of this, if you're not an aging member or whatever else, uh, Denise will cover a bunch of this. So at this point, Denise, I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay, great. Um, interesting that, that Shane, that you brought up um, using this for other societies or, or venues and what have you. I've actually not only given e-lightning presentations at AGU, I have also done it for um, another organization I'm involved with. So I have had uh, experience with both AGU and others, and it is, it's fairly similar the process. So there we go. Took it a second to, to get to me. Um, so e-lightning uh, is, is different. It's beyond kind of your traditional poster. I, I know AGU is also doing virtual posters, but the e-lightning format um, has some added things. A virtual poster uh, for AGU, as far as I can understand, is pretty much just a digital version of your poster. Uh, this is an example of the type of poster that I often uh, present. Um, you can see primarily images supporting text. It's meant to bring you in, and then I explain to you, I, I am the presentation still. Um, you're not necessarily gonna get a whole lot out of this if you just see it, although this one is actually pretty good, I think. Um, <laughs> as it goes. Uh, but an e-lightning is a lot more than just a digital version <clears throat> of your traditional poster. It, uh, you can see here, this is, um, this is a, a capture of the uh, e-lightning poster that I presented last year at AGU on Voices for Science, by the way. So you can go and look at this at AGU, on AGU's website and find out a lot more about Voices for Science, um, as well as being um, a, a science policy advocate as a scientist. So, so you can see here, there's a lot of text on this. And I know Shane has just been telling you, don't put tags, don't put tags, don't put tags. One of the great things about e-lightning is that one, it is persistent. Uh, you will be able to go back to this. Other people will be able to go back to it. So it needs to be able to stand alone on some level. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you can't have added benefit with you being there as part of the presentation. There are other great things. You can have a slideshow. So the, the, the bottom corner here where it says responsible advocacy, that actually is a slideshow. It cycles through a bunch of different images. You can uh, have external links to um, other resources, your uh, supporting data. Um, you can, all each one of these boxes uh, actually expands. So it contains more information than just what you see right there. Uh, so there's a lot more to it than um, you can also, uh, I poster, I will flop back and forth between saying I poster and e-lightning because I poster is the platform, um, just so you know. Uh, I'll flop back and forth between them. Um, there is the ability to do some voiceover narrations. There's an um, ability to embed video as well. So this is a lot more interactive, a lot more dynamic than just your traditional poster. But you, so you're like, okay, all right, yeah, maybe maybe it's all that great stuff, but I can just upload a PDF. I, you know, I don't want to do all this this extra stuff. Um, really, no, you can't. Um, you, iPoster has very specific templates that you need to use. There's there's a good variety, uh, but they may be a little bit different than what you're used to when you're thinking about how you design your poster. Uh, I would encourage you to look at all the different templates and think about what one might work for you. All your content needs to be put into one of these provided templates. Uh, there's a lot of great ways to customize it. You can do a different background, you can change some text, you can, you can do a lot of things to make it yours because if you look through the examples, again, I encourage you to use the web resources at AGU. iPoster actually has a lot of really great tutorials. Um, take the time to look at that. Uh, take the time to look at those. And you'll see that everybody does, does have their own flavor. 
Um, so they, they are still, they're not all looking the same. So you're like, okay, so I can't upload a PDF. It's not just my standard sort of thing, but can I at least still use PowerPoint or Adobe Illustrator or whatever it is that I use to create my content? Yes, but you still will need to import it all, all your individual content pieces into one of the provided templates. However, this is actually a good thing, all right? Because <laughs> this is something, this was the most wonderful thing, piece of advice, um, piece of knowledge I got before I did my first um, e-lightning presentation. I had a friend who did it the year prior and she changed that you can change your template. You can start designing it and you change your template. When you change your template, the content does not necessarily port over. So all that work that you just put in and typing in all of your text is gone if you don't have it in some other sort of platform. So yes, use the programs that you're familiar with and then just port things over. Be aware of some of the, the file limitations and the quirks that iPoster has. And again, the tutorials and the guidelines on the site are very clear and, and you know, um, so related to that, One of the great things about eLightning is that it is, it's more than just a poster. It is more than just um, an oral presentation. It is really a different sort of beast, um, which gives you this great opportunity to start looking, start planning it, maybe uh, planning your presentation a little bit differently. Something that I have found very useful, and I it may be useful to you, it may not, um, or some variation of this. Uh, you know, I used to always just outline my talks um, or recycle things. Uh, and I was doing, I, I think I probably got this from some communication workshop that I was involved with, uh, this idea of storyboarding, where you take the elements that you want to present and figure out how, what kind of, what's your story? What, what is your path that you're gonna take when you walk someone through your poster? What elements need to be uh, you know, discrete, which ones need to be together? And so having this sort of layout, even if the terms are not quite right on this storyboard template that I have um, up here, uh, you know, it helps you figure out, so what sort of images might I need? Um, you know, for the, for the previous slide, I knew that I wanted an image that, that kind of captured the idea that, uh, yes, you can, you can upload content or, you know, um, you know, before it's like I wanted a file icon for PDF. Uh, so I, I would write down that, those sorts of images that I, I'd want as well as figure out kind of what I wanted to say, uh, whether that be text or if you're doing it as a verbal. So this, this is a really, for me, it is a very useful tool, particularly because the, the templates, um, I don't wanna say that they're restricting, but they, there are only certain ways that you can lay things out and this can help you plan that. Uh, so I kind of go back and forth with, between looking at the templates and doing my storyboard to figure out exactly how many content boxes I want, what I want in each, uh, which ones need to be bigger, um, and what sort of flow needs to go. Another, but don't forget that it's not just that digital resource that becomes permanent. You also do have, I, it's three to five minutes, I believe, uh, depending on the session, essentially an oral presentation about your e-lightning, um, your iPoster. So remember though, that this is three to five minutes. That is really not a lot of time. You cannot walk through your entire uh, um, iPoster in three to five minutes. <laughs> um, if you can, no one's gonna understand anything that you said. <laughs> uh, but, when I've when I've done my my presentations about my e posters, I really kind of took to heart some of the science communication tools that I picked up about uh, you know thinking about elevator speeches, thinking about flipping the pyramid. If you've ever heard that term, generally when we're giving a scientific talk, we are aimed on the left side of the 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 the, the point at the bottom triangle 
because we're talking to a researcher. Researchers, we want we want all that background information. We want all that supporting detail before we get to the conclusion, because we're, we don't necessarily want to believe that conclusion without all of that information. But if you're trying to draw somebody in, if you only have a few minutes, you want to make sure that they get your most important point first. You've got to give them that bottom line, that most important thing right away, and then kind of give them a little bit of teaser about, hey, come talk to me or come visit or come look at this more in depth to find out why I came up with this really cool conclusion. So it's a, it is a little bit different way of framing how you do your presentation. Um, but all the presentation tips and tricks that, that Shane and Olivia have gone over are gonna go for that as well. Um, I don't know if those are pre-recorded or not. So sorry, I hadn't looked that up yet this year. Another big tip that I wanna tell you, um, don't forget there is, it's a little unclear kind of in the iPoster interface what publish actually means. Um, before you hit publish, no one else can see what you have done, uh, which great, you know, because it can be ugly and messy and, and whatever. Um, but if you don't hit publish by November 20th, no one's going to see what you've done because that is the deadline um, in order to get it propagated to the AGU system in the appropriate way. But that doesn't mean <laughs> you can't still make changes. Uh, you can make changes up to the time of your presentation, up to, and in fact, be after your presentation, after your session, um, through December 31st is what I, I believe the deadline is this year. You can still make changes. You can still edit it. You can completely change it. If all you have entered in there is your title and your author and you hit publish, you're, you're set. <laughs> I, I mean, I would try to maybe have a little bit more because other people can see it at that point. Uh, but if you are really down to the wire and you don't have anything else ready, please be sure you do that. Um, I really appreciated the ability to uh, add corrections or, or things after uh, the AGU meeting last year. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever you know, stood in front of your own poster board and realized that there's a giant typo on it that all 30 people who you've had proof it have also missed, but it is staring at you the entire time that you're stand, standing in front of it. Um, I always find another typo uh, when I am doing my presentation. Um, and so I, I really appreciate the ability to go back and fix that up through December 31st. And so I know this may seem really, really hard. It's it's not, it's different. And that's why it feels hard. You know, really, it is just different than what you're used to. You do kind of have to start from scratch and figuring out how to plan it, how to develop it, um, how to put it together. Take a deep breath. We really are here to help. And um, I put up this little superhero figure because I really do think the people at Sharing Science with AGU are science communication superheroes. Um, they've taught me a lot. Almost anybody I've met who's identified as a science communicator has taught me a lot about how to do better presentations. Um, so they're a great resource. Please utilize them. AGU has great resources on their website. Um, and really, be kind to yourself uh, because we're all in the same boat. So I think that is my last slide. And so I think it's back to you guys. Great. Thanks, Denise. So uh, before we kind of round out the end of this, um, I'm going to do, I promise, one last poll for, for those of you who are still with us. And thank you all for sticking with us. Many of you have. Uh, so I just want to take another spot check. We've been together for a little over an hour now. Uh, how are folks feeling about their confidence in any sort of virtual presentation? All right starting to level off. Give folks a few more seconds.
All right. And all right, good. So skewing a little bit more towards the more confident side. And that's that's great to hear. We recognize that this is only like an hour long and we can only get, well, by the time we're done, a little bit more than that, but we can only get to so much. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there. We've pointed to some uh, and we will be following up after this with an email with other resources as well. And we'll be taking questions in a second. So we're not quite done yet. Just going back to this, this is part of a series. We have a whole bunch of these other ones with a whole archive that we'll point to. And there is another one, another webinar coming up if y'all are interested in that. Oh no, Denise, I'm sorry. I never updated this. Uh, so in my haste, I did not update uh, Denise's Twitter information, but I'll, uh, I'll make sure we pass that along as well. Uh, but we at AGU are on many social medias. Sharing Science is on there. Olivia and I are both on Twitter. We do uh, silly videos on TikTok for me, and Olivia does a lot of really great artwork for her on Instagram. And yes, we will pass along uh, Denise's information as well because she's on uh, some platforms and definitely worth a follow. Oop. Uh, one thing I want you all to keep in mind, if you're not part of the sharing science community, regardless of whether you're an AGU member, regardless of whether you do any science kind of in our AGU realm, if you are interested in science communication and outreach and policy and any of this type of stuff, I encourage you to join the sharing science community. It's a community for folks interested in this type of thing. And we have a whole bunch of resources that aren't um, necessarily available to everyone out there. We go deep into science behind science communication, lots of science communication manuscripts, a lot of really great stuff. It's free, there's no obligations, anything like that. Um, and you can just spend five minutes and fill out a form for us. And then finally, this is just kind of the take home slide. So resources for kind of the stuff we do and places you can find us. Um, and with that, I think we'll go back to questions. Uh, for those, we've gotten lots of questions. If you have a question to ask, there's a little questions box somewhere in your um, in your GoToWebinar widget that you can ask them as well. Oops, wrong way. Yeah, uh, so one that's more logistical that we've gotten that I'll just try to hit quickly is, um, can we edit all of our content, posters, and e-lightning, or just one type? Now, I'm looking right now at the fall meeting presenter resources, which I recommend everybody look at online. And as far as I can tell, virtual poster deadline to upload is Friday the 20th. However, please note that you'll have access to make updates until 31st December. So that seems to be true for both the posters and the e-lightning. But again, I encourage everyone to check all of the fall meeting uh, presenter resources that are online because they cover a lot of questions in more detail. Uh, so I'm looking just as kind of a heads up. So some folks are have been providing some things in the chat slash question box about some of the things we've been talking about. So folks said that Microsoft Teams does seem to have a similar setup to Zoom for recording if you don't use Zoom. Uh, there's free software like OBS Studio as well. So we'll definitely make sure that we pass these along. Um, when I touched on the, the background and being considerate about things like color blindness, uh, there's a program called Color Oracle that uh, you could use to essentially simulate color blindness. So if you're wondering, okay, well, I don't know if this color is or isn't. Uh, you can kind of see through that lens. So again, we appreciate all of you providing resources. We'll definitely make sure we pull all these together and get them out there for everyone. Um, so some folks kind of going backwards, some folks are asking questions about tech. Uh, so someone asked me about the camera that I use. I threw that in a chat. I like it a lot, um, but frankly, there are a lot of really great webcams out there. Uh, I got the one I got because it was in a package with this microphone that I have, which I specifically wanted because I do a lot of audio recording for our podcast. But frankly, most webcams these days are pretty darn good um, and they can 
webcams can range from like 30 bucks to hundreds of dollars. So it's just a matter of what you want. Similarly, with, with, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, you were gonna say headphones? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it's the same kind of thing. Um, you can get them for relatively inexpensive. I think these are maybe, maybe they were on sale, but they're 40 or $50, I think. Um, and I can't remember if I got them through B&H Photo Video, which is a great place for all kinds of uh, tech and video supplies, or if I got them through Amazon, but I basically just looked at a bunch of them that were in a range I was willing to pay for and read reviews. Um, and I would say there are a number right now, especially that are uh, <laughs> decent quality for not too much money. Um, let's see. We have a question, um, and Denise, I don't know if you can address this or not, mm -hmm. or if this might be something that we have to pass on to our meetings colleagues, which is asking, how do you recommend working on an iPoster with co-authors? Um, I think I think I saw that question, um, and uh, from in the actual content template, you know, in the actual system, I think you would either need to share a login um, to work within the system. But that again comes back to um, developing all of your content in separate programs outside of the actual iP uh, iPoster platform. And so you could still pass those files back and forth, and maybe kind of set up kind of, okay, this is what the template looks like. Uh, I saw another question with somebody asking, where can I find the iPoster templates? The only way to find the iPoster templates, as far as I know, is to log into uh, the iPoster system and look at the various templates there. Uh, I have, I looked, I tried, I tried to find um, like a picture or, or something of the different templates uh, outside of that. And because I am not actually doing any lightning this year, I wasn't able to go into the iPoster system to grab them. So I think the only way to do it. Uh, there was a question is, uh, you know, what is the difference between a virtual poster and an e-lightning? Um, and I'm going to pass that back to AGU people because I'm honestly not sure uh, if they're using the iPoster platform for virtual posters as well. I believe that they are using it okay. for both. And again, this is me looking at the presenter resources because yeah. Shane and I can talk to you about tips, but we don't know the, we're not in those programs very often. So we rely right. on our colleagues just as much as, as all of you. Mm -hmm. That said, I could be wrong. I believe that the difference is that the e-lightning has that oral component, presentation component that you're talking about, Denise. Right. Whereas I think the virtual poster, although you can have audio clips within it and video and all kinds of cool stuff because it's the same uh, platform, mm -hmm. you're not doing that sort of overview of your research, right. I believe. Yeah. Um, somebody else asked if uh, the, the iPosters are going to be available open access after the meeting. Um, Based on previous years, I believe so, because I know that at least 2019, 2018 posters are um, available. Uh, if you just go look for AGU uh, fall meeting 2019 abstracts, it will take you to the iPoster session. So there's a there's a question that's kind of in in our realm, Olivia, just about. Uh, engaging so how can we be more engaging with our audience we don't know who's attending the talk so that's that's especially hard now right because sometimes you might not be able to literally see who's attending your talk but in all fairness it's, it's no different <laughs> or or yeah if it's recorded in advance but even it's no different than if you're giving the talk in person because we we can't just look at someone and say, okay, well, that person looks young, so they're probably at this level in their career, and therefore I should speak to this versus this old dude with a long beard or whatever it is. We, it's clearly we, we, Merlin. We prob, right. We probably do that, but that's not that's not how we should be thinking, anyways. So for any sort of presentation, my suggestion is that. Talk to folks like they have a kind of basic grasp of science because they're all scientists, they're all be there. But if there's anything specific to your field that anyone outside of it wouldn't know, then you need to explain those things. And the best way to know that is to talk to someone outside of your field. Um, grab a friend, grab a family member, or a partner, a colleague, whoever it might be, um, whoever's generous enough to do so, 
And you don't even have to go through an entire talk. Be like, hey, if I was to say thing X, Y, or Z, would you get that? And that's really the best way in any capacity to to eliminate jargon, to speak at folks in their language, to speak at their level. And it's not, this is more general stuff, but we really hate throwing out the whole, um, like you're dumbing down your science. It's not about that. It's about speaking to them in a language, speaking in a language that's shared, speaking to a language that everyone understands. So be really conscious about the things that are specific to what you do and work with other folks, whether, in person or probably virtually, um, to find those points to make kind of the best presentation. And again, highlighting those elements of, you know, where your research is coming from in a broader context of what's understood about the topic, like really spelling that out and also explicitly spelling out what the implications are for what you do. Because again, it might not be as evident to this audience as you might think it is. That's going to make it more compelling too, because then everyone's going to understand why this is meaningful in a broader scientific context. There are um, there are some specific questions about uh, about poster guidelines. I poster Denise kind of already covered this, but I poster versus uh, e post e lightning versus the regular posters. Um, Anything, I, we're not copying out here, but anything that's really specific to AGU and the uh, the formatting and text and all, tech and all of that, really go to the websites. Um, we've reviewed a lot of this, but there's just so much of it that it's probably just best to go to fallmeeting.agu.org, presenter resources, and it's, if like you printed all this out, it'd be like a book this big, but it's very comprehensive and you'll be able to have all of your questions answered there about formatting and text fonts and picture allowances and whatever it might be. Um, that is your one-stop shop for everything you'll need to know about it. And again, if you don't find your answer, you can schedule one-on-ones with our meetings team who are the folks who are in charge of well, the meeting. So they know all of the nitty gritty about this. And also it's come to my attention that the um, the handout for the virtual resources where we put some links um, to those presentation resources is not for some reason linking. So we'll send those links again in the follow-up email that we give you. Um, there's also, I'm noticing there's also a couple of, uh, a handful of questions that frankly, uh, we just don't know the answer to right now. Um, so rather than rather than kind of try to get into and go go over that, uh, anything that we don't answer, or we'll try to get to the stuff we don't answer in the follow up, so that um, we're not just kind of talking off the cuff here and can provide uh, better information that we know is accurate. Because um, yeah, we don't want to we don't want to say anything that we know that turns out later that just is incorrect and misguided. Um, I think just going through things, I think that is, oh, see, now I need to get my dog. I feel, I feel left out. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the bulk of it. Like I said, um, there's, there's other questions, uh, there's things that we'll get to in the follow-up. Hopefully that'll come out early next week at the latest. Um, be aware of your deadlines is the biggest thing. And if you have any questions kind of uh, after the webinar or anything, you can always email us. You can find us on the different platforms. We're always happy to talk about this stuff. And, um, and if we don't know the answer to something, we will find it or we will find you the folks who do. That's the great thing about having all these resources at our disposal. So with that, uh, I think we're going to close out. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Denise for lending your expertise. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's always and, fun. Uh, yeah, of course, it, it's great. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you or at least uh, see your name at a future event. Mm -hmm. Bye everyone.